Suicide Zen Forgiveness, the pod that shares the stories of those affected by suicide. Lost a loved one? Attempted it yourself? Did you know that when you share a burden, the load is lightened? Come listen in with your host, Elaine Lindsay. Suicide Zen Forgiveness, the podcast, is for education only. Some of the subject matter could be triggering for those that are newly grieving or in a poor state of mental health. Please call your local suicide hotline or mental health office if you need immediate help. Hello there. In today's episode, we're going to discuss losing a parent as an adult and the pain and guilt that that can cause, even though it's not your fault. Learning, learning how to go forward from there. My guest is Cynthia Shelton, youthful aging advocate, CEO at Vibrant Living, former director at Career and Technical Education at Oak Harbor School District, also the director of applied learning at Shoreline School District, and the director of vocational education at Federal Way School District. She's also the former executive director at Private Initiatives in Public Education. Cynthia studied at Colorado State University, the University of Montana, and Gonzaga University. She also studied at Central Washington University, and she's originally from Walla Walla, Washington. She's been married to her wonderful husband, John, for 55 years. Cynthia says, what excites me is to inspire women and men who really want to live with vim and vigor, having a vibrant lifestyle like I do at 78, and I don't want to keep this information to myself any longer. Without further ado, let's get to chatting with Cynthia. And I'd love for you to welcome my guest, Cynthia Shelton. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm happy to be here with you, Elaine. Well, as you can already see, Cynthia is incredibly vibrant. So <laughs> that's why she's a vibrant living expert. <laughs> today, we're going to get a little more personal. And we're going to talk about Cynthia's story, because that's the kind of import we like to share with you, our audience. And as usual, we will just have a conversation that you can listen in on. So Cynthia, uh, I'd like you to maybe start wherever you'd like to, but let's, let's have a little look into your personal story. You would like me to give a little bit of my history? Um, That's probably a good place to start. Okay, well, I... I think I was born loving to work. I just, it has always given me so much pleasure to have uh, my friends and my colleagues. And anyway, I just have had a very rich, full uh, career. And I started out as an educator. Actually, I started out as a strawberry picker, if you want to know, and then a cannery <laughs> worker. <laughs> I did all wow. the fun things that you do growing up in Walla Walla, Washington. Yeah. <laughs> it's a agricultural community, but I was an educator and um, then I got into some administration work and then I decided, oh, I want to learn business. So I, re I managed a retail store for a while, which was great fun. Then the neat thing, Elaine, is that on the front page of the Seattle Times, there was an article saying the Seattle Chamber of Commerce wanted to hire a director of school and business partnerships. And I said, that's me. Yes. <laughs> and they had never done it before. They didn't know what they were hiring or what they were even wanting much. They didn't know a lot. Um, I didn't know what they wanted. And I didn't, I mean, it, it was brand new and it was sweeping the nation across the country. School districts were reaching out and chambers of commerce were reaching out Isn't and it? starting to say, let's partner. Isn't that a beautiful concept? It, it really is. I just was crazy about the idea. So I told them I knew what to do now. Honestly, it was so beautiful. We had 10 high schools in Seattle and we partnered each of those high schools with a major company. 
and and we are working on curriculum and principal connections and teacher connections and getting kids out into the community to do internships and oh it was fabulous then we added a hospital we had 10 big hospitals in seattle and every high school got a hospital wow so i mean it was just a, one of those things that launched my love of applied learning and helping teachers and kids really know they needed to do something with the learning they were getting in the classroom. That's kind of it in a nutshell. I love the fact of, of that, that intersection. And, and what I talk about a lot is integration. And mm -hmm. by integrating the business mm -hmm. and the schooling, I think you're, you know, that's uh, the best way in the world to arm the next generations to go yes. forward mm -hmm. in a better format than we have. Yes, yes, absolutely. We didn't, we, we all grew up with that uh, lecture style and yeah. <laughs> sit down and be quiet and let me tell you what, you take notes and then you regurgitate it. Yep. And word for word. And kids re rebelled against that. They wanted to really practice it and see what made sense. And um, if you didn't like blood, you knew to get out of that nursing field that you thought you wanted yeah. to be. I mean, that's what happens. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't suck it up anymore and just yeah. do as you were told. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I know I, for one, grew up in a household where my father's main comment was always, do as I tell you, mm -hmm. not as I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Very different now because um, I know you have grandkids as well. Mm -hmm. And our grandchildren are very much aware of doing their own thing mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. striving to know what that thing is. And how do they know until they actually get to bump up against it, make some mistakes, get out there and bumble around, meet people, interview, observe, yeah. uh, be in a yeah. place where they don't have to be afraid. They're allowed to learn, but in a community setting with, other mentors. That's the beauty. It, it really is. And, and you hit on something really key there. It's being allowed to fail because yes. it wasn't even a matter of whether or not we were allowed to fail or succeed. Mm -hmm. The path was set for you by what your parents knew. Yes. yes. What they had lived, what they chose for you to live or not to live, mm -hmm. depending on only their own experience. Exactly. You know, that film, Hawaii, or was it Pacific, uh, that film, and the woman from Bali was singing, you've got to be taught yes. to love and to fear. You've got to be taught to hate and to fear or love. I mean, all those words go through my mind so much when I think about kids that uh, yeah. didn't have to learn to hate or be fearful, yeah. but that's what they were taught. Oh, absolutely. And, and things, there was a, a certain authoritarianism mm -hmm. through right through the the boomer generation mm -hmm. where you know the 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 parents were the end all be all they they made the rules and you were to live by them period end mm -hmm. of sentence yep there, yep there was no discussion there was no uh -uh. well this is how i feel yeah nobody cared uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh, uh, in the back of my head as we're talking, it's children are to be seen and not heard. Well, so do you want me to take you into the story where I did buck that? Let's do that. Okay, because I bucked it uh, and it backfired. And um, I, I was taught to sit at the dining room table. We had family meals every day. I mean, I don't think they do that anymore, but we had no. family meals and uh, I had two brothers and I was the oldest. And my father would come to the table and he would lecture. And we were we, we would listen and we would, I don't think we asked questions. We agreed and we didn't um, really, we weren't, we weren't asked to bring our own contributions. So over the years, that just was my pattern. I was taught to look up to my parents and to respect them and uh, not to question. And when I was older, like, 55, 60, somewhere in there, um, I realized that my dad had not been kind to the husband, to the man I chose, the man I was in love with. Uh -huh. 
And one night, my husband gave him some information about investing. He just had some information that he wanted to share. Sure. My dad was offended that my husband would, I don't know. Offer? <laughs> offer information. I don't know. I We live close. So I went over the next morning to have coffee with them. And we were just drinking coffee and enjoying each other. Um, my dad then said something about John the night before. And I said, Dad, you know, and this is where I stood up to him. I'd never done that. I said, you know, Dad, you've never been nice to my husband. You've never been kind. You've never listened to him. And he has some good ideas. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long story short, Elaine, I don't want to drag this out. But um, I went home and my dad took his life that day. And so that was probably, I, and I don't share this story other than I know this is a part of what I've experienced that you wanted me to share with your audience. Um, it was very painful because, of course, I thought it was my fault. I thought I had stood up to my father and therefore I created this. I've learned, oh my gosh, I've learned that it wasn't my fault. <laughs> but it was a t tough lesson. It was hard. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. It's not, and my heart goes out to you because, you know, o over the years doing this, I I've heard these kinds of stories where the child, and even though you were an adult, you are still the child. You are forever your parent's mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. And when we, when the onus falls on us, however we choose to accept that, it is an incredibly heavy burden. Yeah. Yeah. And your brothers? Uh, they, they were fine. They did their own rebelling. And boys can rebel, at least in my family, boys could rebel. Um, they, I did say to them once, I think daddy took his life because I, I stood up to him. And my brothers were very compassionate. Oh, no, Cynthia, they said, that's not right. And then they went on. One brother said, you know, I went camping with dad, and he always talked about taking his life. Someday he was going to take his life. Someday when he just didn't want to live anymore. So, okay, that happened to happen on the day that I stood up to him. Um, I, I think I did trigger it, but um, no. it's still not at all. And, and it's, it's interesting, and I, I asked about your brothers on purpose. Mm because it's really interesting when we have siblings, their perspective on our parents is often very, very different from our own. Mm -hmm. And it can be really enlightening when we finally talk to our siblings because they often see things we hadn't mm -hmm. or they were party to things like your brother going camping right. and knowing and understanding that this was probably an ongoing condition for your dad. And it, it is for a lot of people where suicidal ideation becomes the fallback position, if you will, mm, for anything. And the timing, I'm just going to say it because I, I don't know how else to handle it, but for me, I find it cruel. Um, he was cruel in, mm. in doing it after you had been there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he was thinking about anyone except himself. He must have been that way. It, yeah. He must have been really sad. And, and it is. And it's a, it's a type of pain mm -hmm. that we just want to end. And right. When people are in that kind of pain, when suicidal ideation becomes all-encompassing, when you want the pain to end, it's not relevant, the people around you. It, there isn't anybody else to hurt. You just want that hurt to stop for right. you. Right, right. And, and the, the, the vision becomes so myopically focused internally I, I don't think there was ever even a, a hint of what it would actually do to you. Because he loved me very much. So I, yeah. I, if he had stopped to think, 
I, I'm going to be hurting her for a long time. He wouldn't have wanted to hurt me. No, no. And I, I don't think that was any part of it, to mm -hmm. be honest with you. I really don't. Mm -hmm. It just, it's important for people to understand when you're so caught up in your own pain. Right. You don't see anything else. You don't consider anything else. Right. Because pain, be it emotional, mental, physical, it can be all-encompassing. And right. it takes on a life of its own. It is such a big monster. It does not allow room for others. It doesn't allow room for empathy uh -huh. or kindness or consideration. Because if it did, no one would commit suicide. It is, that really helped. Elaine, that helped a lot because I think he had to have been just carrying around a lot of oh yeah madness in his internal and just thought, I'm going to just get out of here. Uh, yeah. And and it it is it's you no know, I'm I'm speaking as as one who who often thinks like your dad. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not even about wanting to leave. It's about wanting to leave the pain. And the only way sometimes that one can see that pain ending is by no longer being. Right. Mm. And, and it is. It's, it's like being in a little box because there, there is nothing outside of you. And I, I can honestly say, having been there multiple times, mm -hmm. I, I had the benefit of Andrea. When Andrea mm -hmm. took her life at 16, she left me with this indelible tattoo right in my face mm -hmm. that every time I was on that edge, through the pain, I couldn't help but see what had happened and how I felt when mm -hmm. she left. It's often passed down, suicidal ideation. It can be part of certain families and what have you. And different people react differently depending on how they were affected by a suicide. So if you didn't go through anything like that earlier in your life, and this was the first time, right. of course it was going to devastate you. Right. But I don't believe there was any intent any ill intent towards you from your father. I don't think so either. And it helps to hear you say that. Oh, I'm so glad of that. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad of that. Because if we can only do one thing, talk to one person today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that they can understand that we now can find tools. We can talk to other people. Mm -hmm. We can find tools to work with the pain, to help us alleviate the pain, the, the thoughts, the suicidal ideation. There are tools that can help. And when you talk to others, that can help so that you don't inadvertently harm someone that you love mm -hmm. by leaving them behind. Mm -hmm in what amounts to a very, very cruel way. Yeah. And and I I'm so I'm so happy for you that your brothers reacted with compassion. Mm -hmm. And and that can only be because they had a better understanding of of who your father was mm -hmm. and, and what he wrestled with. And, and that comes back to our upbringing as well. <laughs> because the men in our lives back in our day were never to show weakness. No, my dad couldn't show weakness. No. Or feelings or, oh, heavens, no. No. That was, it just wasn't the done thing. I'm very typically British when, when I say that. But that's, you know, certain things were feasible. And I can remember at 13 years of age, we were at home in Scotland with my grandparents. And my mom and dad, I don't, I don't even know what it was. My dad was upset. I had never seen that. 
I, in my life. And, and it, it colored the next little while in a weird way because he was my father. Mm -hmm. He wasn't supposed to have weakness. And it, it kind of made me question my father for a while, which was really strange. But, like, oh, it, it just it didn't make any sense. Now, in this day and age, we know that, yes, men are human, too. And, and everybody has feelings. And it was, in a way, I think it was pretty special that he and my mother could be so real with each other. Mm. Mm. You know, not something I'd actually thought about, but it's funny how, you know, the little things that come back to us. Right. Yeah. Well. But it sounds like I, I know I know you've had a wonderful life and, and I not read the list of all the things that you've done and and all the people that you've helped, I mean, that to me is just incredible. And so since you're, you're now the vibrant living expert, <laughs> I would say uh, you've gone on to feel very good. I want to live life fully. It is a passion of mine. When I retired, I was really exhausted and frumpy and old because I had <laughs> neglected myself just commuting three hours a day. And that's a long time to sit and not oh get out. God, and, yeah. yourself. and today when I retired, I just thought I have got to get my energy back, my stamina back, my muscles back, my brain power back. And it feels so wonderful to be able to just share that you can live a long life. You can be happy. You can be well, in fact, my little motto is, if you're going to live long, if you want to live long, then you better want to live well. So let's, <laughs> I mean, who wants to live well, long? And not well. No, longer? no, you want to live well. And um, I love sharing that message with men and women, women and men, because women are more open and receptive to that message. Yeah. Um, women are asking, how can I look good and feel good? as I age, there's nothing wrong with aging, but let's age with as much grace and vim and vigor as yes. we can. Absolutely. Yeah. Aging doesn't mean becoming decrepit. Uh, it just doesn't. And I, I'm sad when I hear people say, oh, I can't do that now. I'm old, you know, and it's a, it's a real, I go, wait a minute. No, no, you can. It might just take a little longer to learn some of these things. Yeah. We can do these things. We can have fun. I'm, uh, I just want people to know that message. And it's, and I don't put expert behind my name. I think you did that, Elaine. I just say advocate. I just, <laughs> people need to know that it's okay to live well and live long and live well. It's okay. And, and you're doing such a good job. You are the poster woman for living well. Absolutely. And the fact is, I think that if people understand that aging really just means we're becoming experts because we've been here longer. I guess it's okay to put that moniker on. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's more than okay. It's, <laughs> it's good. It's really good. <laughs> and I, I love to finish off conversations with such a positive bent because that's really what it's about. It's about living every moment to the fullest. Beautiful. Beautiful. Absolutely. I thank you so much, Cynthia, oh, for joining me today. I'm um, happy to be with you, Lane. I, I, we were, we sparked the minute we met each other. Yeah. You are such an inspiration for all the women that are out there and men too, Elaine. You are an inspiration and keep sharing your message. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I will make sure we will have all of Cynthia's links on the page with all the transcription and information on this Great. episode. I want, as always, to leave you with this. Make the most of your today every day. Thank you again, Cynthia, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe on your favorite service. Suicide Zen Forgiveness was brought to you by Truel Social Media, the digital integration specialists. Let them get you on page one in the search results.